Hey everybody, John Lorden here. Sorry for the late episode today, but this is your brain scratch searchlight for October 4th, 2017. I think once you go through these details with me, you're going to see why this one took a bit longer to research than I originally expected. Um, this is a bit of a recent case. This is a young woman that went missing just in August of this year. And of course, there is a very concerned family that would love to see her come home. Let's see if we can help them by raising exposure to this case and maybe even funneling some tips into them on where she might be. So uh, starting here with a missing poster put together by the Missing Pieces Network, we can see photos of Jenna Van Gelderen from Atlanta, Georgia. Jenna Van Gelderen, age 25, was last seen on the evening of Friday, August 18th, 2017, while house and cat sitting for her parents at their Druid Hills home in Atlanta, Georgia. She was scheduled to stay for the weekend while her parents were in Canada. When her brother stopped by on the morning of Saturday, August 19th, Jenna was missing. The house was locked, but in some disarray. A large painting was reportedly missing from a frame on the wall. Jenna's blue 2010 Mazda 6 sedan with Georgia plate number PWH5902 was also gone. That has been since recovered. We'll get to those details in a little bit. Her purse and phone were missing, but her phone chargers were left behind. There has been no activity on her phone, bank accounts, or social media accounts since the day she disappeared. Jenna is described as 4'11", 140 pounds with long, dark hair, and has pierced ears. Her disappearance is very out of character. Uh, heading over to the NamUs profile, we're going to see just about the same information, nothing real different here. Um, white female from Atlanta, Georgia, last seen August 19th, 2017. Um, her hair color is black. Her eye color, which I don't think was on the poster, uh, is brown. And they note that she does have almond-shaped eyes. In terms of tattoos, she has a Star of David tattoo on her upper thigh. And they also note that her ears are pierced. Um, clothing and accessories. She was last seen possibly wearing a green t-shirt with the words San Antonio on the front. She could also be wearing a black spaghetti strap shirt and black yoga pants. Uh, unknown for the footwear. That's one of the strange things. It seems like the shoes that she was wearing, um, at least to her parents' house, were actually left at that house. But she did have a lot of personal belongings in her car, so it, it is possible that she does have some of her other shoes. Um, on the vehicle, they have the details here, but the vehicle has been found, so we don't really need to dive into those too much. Dental information is being collected. DNA information is being collected. Fingerprint information is available. Um, and then we have a couple of images, including um, something of what the tattoo would look like, uh, just a traditional Star of David. Uh, we also have some investigation information. I will have this in the description box below, including the case number. Um, I found when calling in on these cases, it really, really helps to have that case number. Sometimes the person you get on the phone is just not familiar with the actual case that you're referring to. So always good to have that. Uh, jumping over to her LinkedIn profile. Uh, describes her as a reliable hard worker looking for an entry-level administrative assistant or data entry position. It notes that she currently works for a place called Pet Supplies Plus, but we're going to find out that is actually not accurate. Um, prior to that, she did do some uh, babysitting, it seems like, child care providing. Um, for certifications, she has a QuickBooks certi certificate from Gwinnett Technical College, and it looks like she went there um, for an administrative support assistant certificate program. Also notes that what she cares about is animal welfare, just to give you a bit of um, background on her. Moving over to CBS46.com, let's get some more details about what happened. Jenna Van Gelderen, 25, was house and cat sitting for her parents while they were vacationing in Canada and was scheduled to stay the weekend. Her brother stopped by the home on August 19th to check on her, but she wasn't there. Uh, according to her brother, who has been posting a lot on web sleuths. That's part of the reason why I didn't want to rush this episode. I read every single one of his posts. 
Um, she was cat sitting, but this cat requires medication and she was not comfortable giving the cat medication. So her brother um, stopped by on a few occasions. Supposedly this Saturday morning drop by was supposed to be the last time he was going to stop by because he had other things to do that weekend. Um, and there was a an assistant from a vet clinic that was stopping by in the afternoons to give the cat medication as well. The brother told police that the home was in disarray. A large painting was reportedly missing from the wall and her vehicle was gone. Um, if you're anything like me, I was super curious about this painting and I've heard it described a few different ways. Painting, some people are saying tapestry. Here is a photo um, that was actually provided by the brother on Web Sleuths and we can get a bit of a better sense of what it is. It looks a lot more like a quilt that has um, some Egyptian imagery on it. So uh, apparently there was three pieces to this. Uh, it is a buffet cover and there was two table um, tablecloths with it. The tablecloths were not framed and those were left behind, but the larger piece that was in a frame, which I've, I saw some footage of it, it looks like it's probably four, maybe even five feet wide. It's a fairly, fairly large piece. Um, somehow that piece was taken out of the frame. Uh, according to info from the brother, it looks like the glass on the front panel was broken in some way, so the glass could be taken out. Uh, then the item was removed, but then the glass was put back into place in the frame and it was hung back up on the wall. I guess um, going through the back of the picture frame, which is what most of us I think would do if we were going to remove something, uh, was a bit more difficult because the back of the, the frame was all wood. Um, so it seems like someone might have wanted that item and to grab it. Uh, in, in a quick way, as opposed to spending more time finding the right tools to pry open the back and take it out. Uh, a lot of people are wondering why did they remove it from the frame? With an item that large, uh, it might've been hard to fit the frame in a vehicle. Um, so it does make sense that someone might remove it, roll it up, and then it'd be much easier to transport. However, the big thing is her, her father in particular says that this item is not a expensive item. I mean, they haven't had it appraised or anything like that. Uh, it is from around the World War II era, but they don't believe that there's any substantial value to that item. Outside of that item being taken, there wasn't really anything else that they've noticed that's been taken from the house. So outside of, of course, their missing daughter and her vehicle. The suitcase that she brought into the home uh, it was also initially missing. However, we will see later they do um, find that suitcase when they find the car. Uh, on top of that, the way that the home was in disarray, the brother gave some more detail on that. He noted that it was um, possibly from a get together she had there on Thursday night with some friends of hers that had come over. Uh, she had some friends, I, I don't know if they slept over, but somehow they had used some of the rooms upstairs. They didn't clean it up immediately. And that seems to be most of the disarray. Um, there is nothing in the home to indicate that there was any struggle that actually went on in the home. So I just wanted to make that clear because I know when you hear, you know, yeah, something was taken, the house was in disarray, it sounds like there might have been a struggle. According to uh, police, no struggle has been detected there. Uh, they also note in this article, police say that there has been no activity on her phone, bank accounts, or social media accounts since the day she was reported missing. Of course, um, that's never a great indicator when we're looking into these cases. Heading over to uh, Decatur-ish, is the name of the website, decaturish.com. Uh, let's get some more detail. This was a really interesting turn in the case because apparently at some point, the family got on social media and said she's been found but then that was quickly retracted. So let's try to get some details on that. Yesterday, her family reported that she had been found and is safe, but the family received bad information from DeKalb County Police, according to her brother. Quote, it sounds like they thought they had her last night, and this morning they told us they made a mistake, her brother said. A spokesperson for DeKalb Police said there was no miscommunication. Quote, we never said that we found her. Galdurin 25 was last seen on Friday. Uh, there was no sign of forced entry or a struggle. Her blue 2010 Mazda is also missing. Van Galdurin's friend said she saw her on Friday and they had a brief conversation before she left. 
uh, her friend had not heard from her since. Another friend said she had a conversation with Van Gelderen on Saturday and later received a text from her saying she was lying down. Her friend said she hadn't heard from Van Gelderen since and was trying to call her, but her phone kept going straight to voicemail. And even though it does say that that occurred on Saturday, it's worth noting that we're talking 2 a.m. on Saturday is when that last text message was sent. So practically Friday night, very, very early on Saturday morning. Jumping over to the Facebook page, which I believe the brother is also running. Uh, let me just say real quick, um, this guy is working very, very hard. All the communication that I see him doing on web sleuths, the fact that he's helping to keep this Facebook page moving, he's working with private investigators, he's keeping up with trying to support his family. I really, really feel for this guy, and it's obvious how much he cares about his sister and is trying to to bring her home. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, William, keep up the hope, keep up the amazing work, man. You are, you are truly inspiring. Um, but back to the Facebook page, help find Jenna VG. Uh, this was posted on September 21st. We have retrieved Jenna's car. Most of her belongings are still inside. However, her phones and green San Antonio t-shirt are still missing. Car found off DeFour Place across from Street Execs Studios. Uh, anyone with information or who lives in this area that may have been seen when the car was left there, please email findjennanow at gmail.com. I will have that email address in the description box below as well. And what I really wanted to show you here was uh, we get a good shot of the vehicle and you can see her suitcase that was missing from the house that had her, her uh, items for that weekend stay was found in the car. Uh, several other things were found in the car. We'll get into those once I get into more notes from the brother's information on web sleuths. Heading over to AJC.com, quote, there was no reason to believe she would leave unexpectedly. Leon Van Gelderen, Jenna's father, told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Many of Jenna's personal items were still in the home. Quote, what woman takes off and leaves her makeup and toiletries and shoes behind, Van Gelderen said. Though she wanted to be an independent adult, Jenna Van Gelderen had developmental disabilities as a child that affected her social interac interactions as an adult, her father said. Because she's very impressionable, she has been taken advantage of by a lot of people, Van, Gel Van Gelderen said. William Van Gelderen told police his sister had been prostituting. And I have that highlighted in green for a reason. If we jump over to the next article at 11alive.com, family slams police report allegedly calls their missing daughter a prostitute. They're concerned that misinformation has been a great hindrance to the investigation. Quote, my son never said his sister was a prostitute. Never, Leon said. It was a disgruntled ex-boyfriend that said that. The report also indicates that she has gone missing before. Never, absolutely never, never disappeared, Leon said. If she ever went to South Carolina, that's the furthest she's ever gone. We knew where she was going, who she was going to be with, and she was always in contact with us. Apparently, she has a friend in South Carolina that she would frequently uh, travel up there to babysit for. Uh, while the family said the investigation did not start off the way they wanted, they do now believe police have a vested interest in helping find Jenna. And they've since hired a private investigator hoping to follow every lead. According to what I read from the brother, it seems like they had one private investigator that was working on it, and possibly they've switched to a different private investigator, or they have two. I, I'm not really clear uh, one way or the other, but there's been at least two PIs working on it. Heading over to WSBTV.com. Let's learn a little bit more about Jenna. The 25-year-old Gwinnett Tech graduate has a form of high-functioning autism and likes her routines, according to her parents. Quote, it's still surreal, her mother, Roseanne Glick, said. I go to sleep crying. I wake up crying. I keep thinking, worrying, and know that she would never have just left. Jenna was taking care of the family's 21-year-old cat. Uh, Glick says that she talked to her daughter once or twice a day and is desperate for anyone with information to come forward. 
Anything that you could give us to help us find her, we want her home. We love her tremendously, she said. So, of course, you can see a lot of, lot of pain going on in this family over Jenna missing. Uh, heading over to patch.com, we now learn the family has offered a $10,000 reward for her safe return. Um, of course, just another usual step to take in these cases. And a little interesting tidbit here. Someone was in that car with her and came back to her parents' home. Um, I'm, I'm still not 100% certain how, certain how that conclusion is made, but we do know that when the car was found, the driver's seat was all the way back and the seat was all the way lowered. Not back like they were laying down, but the seat was um, lowered, lowered to the ground as if a taller person was driving. Um, there is some information out there that she was seen with another person, uh, I believe in her mother's car. Uh, we're going to get into, into more of those details here in a moment. Uh, so there does seem to be this belief the family has put out on their Facebook page that someone was with her, they came back to the home, and then it appears that that person also left with her. So if you are interested in seeing her brother's information, um, there are at this time three threads on Web Sleuths about this case. Uh, if you search on the username Subi Climber, that is her brother. It has been verified by Web Sleuths. You'll see when you look through his comments that it says that this is a verified family member. Um, there are, I think, probably literally hundreds of, of comments here. As I mentioned before, I read through each and every one of them and I took some notes. So I want to go through those uh, with you and get much more detail here. And if you guys have watched my um, videos on what to do in missing persons cases, uh, I think the brother is doing a great job getting this level of detail out there. Uh, when you're asking for the public's help, it really helps to have some idea of where she was, when she was there. Um, I haven't found, I, I have found one timeline. I haven't found a timeline put out by the family. I know they're working with a PI. The PI is probably telling them don't release that information. Um, I believe that a family should do a version of a timeline that has been simplified just to let the public know specifically if they were at a particular place at a particular time, did they notice her or her vehicle there? Um, so Web Sleuths had a very good user, I believe their name is A Bit of Hope, that has gone through all of William's comments and put, put together a timeline. Now, it was a really tough timeline to get through because it kind of mashes together being a timeline with noting all of its sources and having a bunch of open questions all interjected in the same thing. So I've gone through a version of that timeline. I've tried to clean it up for this video. I'm trying to keep it as concise as possible. Um, but before we get to the timeline, I want to go through things that the brother noted that I thought you might be interested in. First of all, her autism diagnosis uh, only happened in December 2016, according to him though he acknowledges this was a lifelong issue for her. Basically, it seems like the family knew they were dealing with something with her for most of her life, but it took a very long time for that diagnosis to come in. She no longer works at the pet store. She was fired for stealing, and it seems like the pet store actually even took her to court over that. Um, it seems like she was stealing some relatively large amounts of money from what I could see about the discussion around this. Um, we don't know why. And there's this weird thing that I've been getting when I'm reading through the comments here where the brother will frequently say, you know, she was very private about that information or she wouldn't talk to us about that or her friends won't talk to us about certain details. A lot of people are questioning, did she indeed have a second life going on here that her parents did not know about? Something that actually supports that is she did have a second cell phone, a Metro PCS cell phone. That's on top of an iPhone that was with the T-Mobile network that was on her family's plan. So I don't think... I would assume that, especially if she was out of work for this period of time, she probably wasn't having to pay her phone bill for the iPhone. But for some reason, she went and got her own secondary phone. Um, as a matter of fact, even when that comment in the media pops up about, you know, the brother said that she might be prostituting, there's some information in here that might lead some people to that belief. 
I'm still completely uncertain, but we're gonna we're gonna review that here. Um, back to the information about her working at the pet store. After the incident at the store she worked at, parents had noticed that she was staying out late, not helping as much around the house. Uh, they had requested that she respected the house rules like any adult should. It finally came down to us all talking and saying that maybe having to move out would help her grow up a little, be motivated to find a job, etc. We offered to still help her financially as long as she worked on finding a job. Parents also had bought her that Mazda 6 after her last car crapped out, and she needed transportation to go to job counseling and interviews, etc. So once again, even in this blurb, we're hearing information that she might have been dealing with something else here, might not be prostitution, um, possibly could be some type of drug use. I would imagine it's really tough going through life with an undiagnosed uh, disorder like this. Could she have possibly been self-medicating or maybe did the diagnosis even prompt her to begin self-medicating in some way, something along those lines? I don't know. But we've got her obviously stealing money. We've got her family being so concerned that they're asking her to move out. They're hoping that this is going to help her uh, kind of spread spread her wings. Um, but they are noting, it seems like a, a change in behavior here. So I, I believe she might have already been dealing with something uh, at this point. Let's continue. Um, male roommate not cooperating with family. So a lot of people were asking him, have they searched her apartment? And we found out that uh, she had a male roommate. The police went there and he initially would not let them enter. But it's not really that he is her roommate. According to information I saw later, it seems like she is basically crashing at his place, um, sleeping on the couch. I don't think she even had her own room. Um, but it did take police a long time. They didn't actually get into her apartment until August 30th. So, you know, you're, you're talking uh, almost two weeks after. Uh, when they did get in there, nothing of interest was found. Of course, this raises a lot of questions for people. Does that mean that the male roommate possibly hid some stuff? Uh, I don't know. It could also mean that she just really didn't live there like most of us consider. Um, her brother says in a different post that she seemed to keep a lot of her personal items in her car. Maybe she just took in, you know, that suitcase uh, for nights where she was staying there. I'm really not certain. House and car not fingerprinted until almost a month later. Um, another point of frustration for the brother uh, and for the family in general is that the house where we highly assume someone else was there with her uh, and the car were not fingerprinted until almost a full month after the fact. And they basically had to complain to the chief to get that to happen. Uh, also, the picture frame, I believe, was not fingerprinted until much later. And I, if I recall correctly, it seems like the frame had been cleaned. Um, so I don't think they found any prints on that as well. Second cell phone, Metro PCS. Um, there was a phone that had called that phone uh, sometime. I think there was actually two dials that happened around 11 that night. And when he looked up the phone number that had called that phone, uh, he found an Instagram account that mentioned pimping and some clubs in the area. Um, once again, if we're looking at that theory that there is some type of prostitution or possibly some human trafficking type element going on here. This is just another small indicator. It doesn't prove anything definitively, de definitively by far, but it's an interesting turn. Uh, also this, the Metro PCS phone is not under her proper name, but it is hers. She basically used her middle name as her first name and she used her first name as her last name. So that account is under the name Ruth Jenna. This threw some confusion the brother's way when he was originally trying to get access to this account because um, they were telling him that the name that he was given him was not the name of the actual account holder. So I believe they did subpoenas for that. Uh, they have now found out that this account is basically under her name, but it's under an alias where she has twisted her name up. Once again, from my perspective, this is pointing to some type of secondary life I don't necessarily know that it's prostitution, um, might be drug related, something along those lines. You have to think, what would motivate someone who doesn't have a regular source of income to take on a bill for themselves, 
Uh, and obviously she was having trouble paying bills because her car insurance wasn't paid for August. That's part of the reason why she wound up driving her mother's car around once she was house sitting. Um, something has to motivate you to want a second cell phone when you've already got an iPhone sitting in your pocket that I don't think you're necessarily having to pay the monthly bill on. Uh, media misquoting her brother, confusing his comments with bitter ex-boyfriend who said she was prostituting. Once again, do we know that we should discount the ex-boyfriend's information at this time? I'm not necessarily sure with these little tidbits of info that are coming from her brother. Um, and I do think that some of that information might support that conclusion, um, but we still n far from definitive information on this. Uh, one of the things a little interesting is her brother did find that she was using many different types of texting apps, not very well-known ones, um, but he really got some good access to both of her phone accounts. And I'd have to believe that if she was, um, if she was doing that type of work, I think he would have found better traces of it than we're seeing here. But this does lead me to believe there's a second life of some kind. I just don't know what it is. At one point, he posted, we have a person of interest. He is the last person to see her that Friday night, and his stories keep changing on when and where he saw her and has previously been at the house and driven Jenna's car, according to friends. Bit of an interesting twist. Keep that in mind while we're going through the timeline. Uh, we know Friday night she had been in contact with this person of interest uh, via text calls and seeing him. According to him, she came to his apartment approximately 10 p.m. Uh, the area that she was at on the timeline for that time frame does not line up with the address that RPI and police have for him. She stopped in the area of English Avenue, North and Northside Drive for about five to six minutes around 10 p.m. From what I know, the PI and police have him located further south of the city, right below I-20. We know a little after this, that she went to Wendy's, then came back to either her apartment or a townhome that I mentioned earlier, um, that he mentioned earlier. I actually haven't talked about this townhome yet, but uh, I believe he traced one of the phone calls to her Metro PCS phone to someone that lived in a townhome that is almost directly behind the apartment that she was staying at. Um, they went and questioned this person. This person says that uh, he does know her, but did not see her that evening. And apparently his information about where he was that evening has checked out. Uh, we know she specifically searched for that townhome address that Wednesday. And when I search more in her Google timeline, that is the address that shows up, not her apartment specifically. It's a gated community, but it's literally behind her apartment. She could have visited this address or she could have just used it as a reference to get to her to her apartment. We just don't know. The other thing about it being a gated community is I would assume that there's some type of log um, on who accesses or if there was, you know, the gate was opened at that point. I don't know if there is a security guard that's actually sitting out at the gate that has a, a roster that he's keeping of everyone that goes in. But even if it is a gated community where you just call to the home and then uh, the gate buzzes open, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't some type of log of what, what homes are buzzing the gate. Uh, and I'd be curious if that log was reviewed to see if she was possibly there that night or not. My dad put pressure on the chief as to why they never fingerprinted my mom's car or the house. And Thursday, they finally did come to do so, but will, will not tell us what they found, only that it may be too late for that. Uh, very early on in the case, an investigator had mistakenly identified Jenna on back page based off her driver's license photo. The next day, they were told that it was the wrong person. Uh, he did post when the car was found and told the um, Web Sleuth's audience it was being processed. The only thing we know at this point is that no windows were smashed, but driver's seat was pushed all the way back. Uh, he once again mentions where it was found. Police initially said a lot. However, my dad confirmed since he also went down there when it was found, it was actually on the street. Her suitcase with clothes and other shoes are in the trunk. Uh, I can tell, though, that the driver's seat was pushed all the way back and fully down, not how she would have driven it. I also found an iPhone 7 Lightning to headphone adapter on the driver's seat. I think that's really critical, and I'm surprised that he's the one that found that if the police actually processed this. Um, 
I, I would hate to think that he touched it when he found it, but I'm kind of assuming he would have. If that item actually belongs to the person that took her, there's a really good chance that there could have been a fingerprint on that, uh, at least a partial, depending on how big that item is. But I don't know. Jenna had an iPhone SE, which did not need this. I'm not sure if this is relevant or not yet. Uh, one more thing, car was not out of gas. It was on E, but it definitely had enough that my dad was able to go a few miles to the nearest gas station. Uh, then some people on Web Sleuths asked him, did the police possibly put some more gas in it to see if it was still functioning? He was trying to find an answer on that, but I didn't see any follow-up on that on Web Sleuths. But another big tidbit, her purse, ID, and debit card were found in the car. So you guys know that when I look into cases like this, I get fairly concerned when a person's method of transportation has been taken from them. Uh, they're not taking their personal effects with them. And then, of course, their ability to support themselves, to pull out their own money, is not with them. And on top of that ID, um, I'm fairly concerned about what is going on with, with Jenna in this case. Let's move into the timeline that was um, has been worked on by Bit of Hope. And I don't mean to only give credit to Bit of Hope because I know on Web Sleuths, typically there's a lot of people that work on something like this and put it all together. Um, but let's go through it. August 17th, Thursday. She had some friends over for a small get together Thursday night and didn't clean up the rooms upstairs. Uh, this info came out later from a friend who was over there. Right now, we know of Jenna and two others that were at the house that night for sure. Uh, they're trying to find out if anyone else may have been there. August 18th on Friday, uh, this is from the written from the brother's perspective. I was at the house Friday morning to give the cat her meds. I remember seeing Jenna's car there. I saw her Friday morning. That was the last time I saw her. She seemed fine. No indication anything was out of the ordinary. Around 2 p.m., meds were given that Friday afternoon. The vet assistant came by around 2 p.m. He did not have a key to the house, so Jenna had to have been there to let him in. Somewhere between 4 and 5, her brother uh, once again spoke with her on the phone to confirm that everything was okay for the rest of the weekend. 6 p.m., uh, a girlfriend that was with Jenna that day took an Uber home before Jenna went out again. From 8 to 10, she was also in contact with one other guy that night on and off between 8 and 10. From interviews with him, he advised her not to come to his part of town, College Park, with my mom's car, and that he would meet her closer to her apartment. According to him, she never showed. Um, this is the guy I found with the Instagram profile that led me to believe some kind of pimping or trafficking might be going on. He also called twice at 11 and 11.50 that night, pocket dials. Uh, on the pocket dials, apparently, the voicemails that were left, you just hear the phone rattling around in his pocket. There was nothing really detailed to come out of uh, those voicemails. 10 p.m., we know Friday night she had been in contact with a person of interest who they're referring to as person one. Uh, he's an ex-boyfriend she broke up with in February, and they were in contact via texting, calling, and she saw him. According to him, she came to his apartment around 10 p.m. She left around 11 p.m., and she was in her mother's car. Uh, he claims that she wanted a relationship, but he did not, knowing about the theft issue that she had experienced or gone through. Uh, the ex is the one who also claimed she came by his apartment that Friday night, and he told her that the relationship wasn't going anywhere. Now, according to Google Timeline, she had not gone to his place at all that day, unless it had been after 11.30 p.m. when the timeline ends. She told us it was 11 p.m., and he told the police that it was 10 p.m. That's what makes this suspicious. We also have some tips from others via email yesterday saying they know he was at my parents Friday night trying to verify. Um, I did see some dialogue from the brother about her potentially being abused by an ex-boyfriend. I don't know if this is the same guy. It's possible that it is. Um, 11 p.m., pocket dial on the Metro PCS, and once again mentioning that the number's tied to an Instagram account with references to pimping and clubs on Campbellton Road. 11.30, that's when the Google timeline ends. And his assumption on that is her phone might have been running out of power, might have gone into power saving mode and maybe turned off the features that allow for Google timeline to continue tracking. 
Uh, from 11.45 to 12 a.m., uh, she was texting with her friend in South Carolina. Uh, then we have an undetermined time at some point that night. She was seen with an unidentified male passenger in her mother's car. Um, per the flyer on help find Jenna Van Gelderen's Facebook page. Uh, by whom, where, and what time are the questions? And I would really love to have the answers to those, but I haven't been able to find them. So uh, is this possibly when she went to visit the ex-boyfriend? Maybe did they drive somewhere together? Uh, I don't know. 11.50, the second pocket dial happens. Um, and 1.30... It seems like her iPhone now goes into power saving mode as all the tracking stops on that device. And then around 2 a.m., uh, Jenna had sent a text to her friend in, uh, in South Carolina saying that she was laying down. Now, there's some question about that text. Um, did it really come from her at that time? Uh, I think it's, it's a good question. We don't have a whole lot of activity. We have the pocket dials happening around you know, 11, 1150. Why didn't she answer the phone during those? And then much later, she is texting her friend saying that she's laying down. I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, her debit card use on Friday mentions four different gas stations, which is kind of interesting. Uh, apparently it was used at a Texaco at North Decatur Road. Uh, it was used at DeKalb Industrial Chevron at Cheshire Bridge. Uh, 11 p.m., it was used at La Vista Wendy's, and they confirmed that she was at Wendy's because a straw wrapper was found in uh, his mom's car. Looks like it was used at a gas station at La Vista and Cheshire Bridge around 11, and then Chevron at North Decatur Road and Claremont. Um, why is someone going to so many different gas stations within one night? It's a really good question. Uh, one of the theories I saw on Web Sleuths is that, you know, this is a way that some people operate perhaps if they are uh, working in prostitution uh, or possibly drug distribution, something along those lines. Um, does it have to do with this seemingly second life that seems to be indicated from all this information? It's, there's a very good chance of that, I think, but it's hard to know for sure. And even after reviewing all this information, I just, I don't feel definitive about what what is going on with this second life. I just feel that something is going on with this second life, mainly because of the cell phone. Why are you going to get this extra cell phone? Uh, and there are some questions about how is she supporting herself through all this? Uh, she hasn't been working for a number of months at this point. Um, you know, how do you just keep yourself fed? Even if you do have a place to live where a guy's letting you crash on your couch and assuming he's not charging her anything for that, uh, just the normal course of life. How are you putting gas in your car? Maybe she has a gas card from her parents. Okay. Maybe her parents are paying for her cell phone. Okay. How is she eating? How, how is she buying stuff for herself? How is she getting clothes? How is she getting makeup? There's still life life keeps throwing little expenses your way. How are those being handled? I really don't know. So uh, it's a tough one, guys. And the family is asking for help. There is a GoFundMe that has been started. Um, it's been doing fairly well. It's only started a couple of days ago. They're looking to raise 15,000. They're already at five. Uh, that was raised over five, raised by 70 people in only two days. And it looks like this was also created once again by her brother. This guy is just working so hard. Um, on behalf of myself and my amazing Patreon supporters, we will be donating to this GoFundMe today. And um, if the family is out there, Will, if you do happen to see this, I'm going to have a link in the description box below to my missing person tips website where I have two videos in particular. There might be something in there that helps you. Uh, I know how hard you're working on this. So if there's anything that we can do to help you, I just wanted to make that clear. So please check out uh, my missing person tips and maybe there's some info in there that can be beneficial to you. For everyone else, if you have friends in the Georgia area, please share this video with them. Let's raise exposure to this case. Let's try to get more eyes and more importantly, more hearts out there uh, aware of Jenna and looking for her. 
And if you are a person out there that thinks you might have information, but you're not really sure, just use the, inf the contact info below. You never know what a small little piece of information can do for a case like this. And if you don't feel comfortable calling the police, there is also an email tip line where you can just email the tip in that is going to the family and the private investigators. And of course, they're sharing that information with the authorities as well. So... Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I appreciate each and every one of you out there that helped make this show what it is. I can't do it without you guys. Uh, I hope you are all staying safe and happy, and I will see you back here on the Lord and Arts channel tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>